Don't think healthcare professionals have any business experience? Think again. No topic is off limits as we share tales from our brave hosts who will always tell it like it is. We are hashtag no filter healthcare. Here to guide you through your healthcare journey are your hosts, Taylor Dunn and Tamara Donda. We want to thank our sponsor, Uptime Health, the leading healthcare equipment and compliance management software company for bringing this podcast to fruition. Visit UptimeHealth.com to learn more. Let's get started. Welcome to hashtag no filter healthcare. I'm your co-host, Taylor Dunn. And I'm your other co-host, Tamara Donda. And today we have our guest speaker, Trevor Maurer, CEO of OMS360. Trevor, it's great to have you here today. Good to be here. So it's fun. The, uh, the, the preamble to actually recording is the best part of my day so far. So thanks for setting <laughs> this up. Yeah, no problem. You know, we're characters here on, on this podcast. That. We like to you know um so uh we're, we're cracking up be already because apparently we have trouble with last name pronunciation yes. <laughs> it was me it was me guilty as charged so we're really we're really excited to have you here and learn your perspective on doctor recruitment and employee retention um but before we get into that i would love to have you introduce yourself and how you ended up uh, in your current role with OMS 360. Yeah, sure. Happy to share that. Um, I'd probably start though with your comment on how excited you are to have me here. I don't know why that would be, but I'm appreciative of it. Thanks for the that. Um, so my background, uh, literally way back, small town Canadian farmer dude and ended up at college because I figured out if you played sports, you didn't have to start work yet. And I like literally just ended up with a degree and then, uh, in the work in the work field, found a passion for healthcare. Um, so, a number of different healthcare organizations. Procter and Gamble you might not think of as healthcare, but there's a healthcare arm there. I worked for Procter and Gamble in Novartis in Canada, and then came down to see the Olympics here in beautiful Atlanta in 1996, and stayed because for less than a million dollars you can get a- a- anything uh, to live in. And Vancouver is ridiculous. So, came from Vancouver, Canada. It was uh, nuts, and so just stayed in Atlanta. Love it. Great spot. I um, was at Novartis for a while. Uh, then I did a, uh, a healthcare venture capital backed technology company in Manhattan for a few years. I had a startup uh, here on my own in Atlanta and then worked with uh, a franchising group. Uh, we franchised 4,000 optometry locations in the US, uh, which was a significant chunk of that market. And then took over a dental group uh, of 32 franchise dental offices in Texas and uh, was fortunate to grow that with a great team to 750 locations in 43 states in eight years. And uh, just loved that experience and had the experience as a Shore Capital Partners, it's a venture capital, or sorry, a private equity fund out of Chicago and was on board of one of their companies, uh, Southern Orthodontic Partners. And we were looking at, you know, where, where Shore is going next and just aligned on oral surgery, which is a great spot. And I was really excited about the opportunity and uh, stepped in as a CEO and co-investor to start OMS 360 here. We're about 15, 16 months in and we are boringly on plan. We're on track, which is great. <laughs> but, you know, when you're on your we're at budget. Great. And then you move on. Right. Uh, but yeah. uh, it's been a twisty road to get here. I have so much respect for the Shore Capital Partners fund. Um, I, they, I like the way that they, they view healthcare multi-site within their portfolio, which is most of their portfolio, but they've uh, done a great job. They started 51 companies. I think there's 34,000 employees across the portfolio companies that they hold right now. And uh, their, their exits are the, the best in the world. They're, uh, you know, they're running average cash on cash returns of over, over seven times return on investment, which is nuts. Uh, and they just build really great companies to last forever. So it's just, it's an honor to have an opportunity to run, you know, one of their companies to be a, a little piece of that big pie. And I live in Atlanta, uh, married, five kids. They're all either out of college, four went to Georgia, one went to Georgia Tech. Uh, of course, he's an engineer. What a surprise. And then they've either graduated or in their senior year. So empty nester shortly. <laughs> I, I love to hear how y- your uh, career has evolved and where you started. And it's it 
it's funny because you're like, I don't know if I was going to go to college, but looking at your career path, it's pretty amazing. So I know and it's funny, like from a business perspective, I, I like to say like I'm a I'm a marketer in a salesman's body with a accounting mind. Like I have an accounting degree, which is, I don't know what how that happened. And then I didn't like it and ended up in, in sales. But, you know, one of my um, most favorite career paths my past has been uh, marketing, just the strategy behind it and just the leverage you can pull to, to drive growth. So a tip, I, I'd, I'd love to view things through a marketer's lens, but always with an eye on the P&L at the same time from the accounting background. Yeah, you're going to um, have a chance to talk to Tamara about marketing. She she does marketing for Uptime Health and um, I've learned a lot through her as well. I mean, I never thought I'd be talking about marketing in my career, but it is it is really fun to be creative and um, try new things and get into the mind of a client and how they're going to approach your product or service. It's really cool. So I can really see Tamara that. going there. It's really just manipulation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, basically, yeah. Well, let's get into a little bit more about the strategy behind OMS 360. So, you know, one of the benefits of partnering with your company is access to strategic resources. So, can you elaborate on what some of those resources might be and how they can help a practice grow and thrive? Yeah, sure. Basically anything non, non-clinical is where we lean in, right? We try to be clinically agnostic with the doctors, except for you know where we can help them optimize the practice or drive organic growth through strength. But if you think about anything non-clinical, and, and it's not really exciting, staffing, right? We're going to talk about that, but it is really difficult for a thriving practice to take time out, place the ad, do the interviews. They're not classically trained in in ad writing or interviewing or behavioral testing or anything like that. They basically sit with a candidate. A, if they show up for the interview, they have a good chance of getting hired today. And if they like them, right? Versus, you know, the behaviors that drive success and, and high performance in the role. So something as simple as that or cybersecurity. Right? What, what are they doing for cybersecurity? I don't know. I hired an IT guy. I hope we hope he does a good job. And so, you know, a couple of boring things like that, you know, right up to revenue cycle management and, and talent development are are the things where we lean in, where through our size and scope, we have, I think, very talented people to support that. You know, our our CFO has last role led 1,400 hospitals from an operational finance perspective. Right? That's how do I have that person here in this tiny little company in our infancy, right? He's like the unicorn. He, he is helping us do a startup, but with a, with a line of sight on a billion dollar company, right? Our head of HR is a published author, Dr. Demi Gray, psychologist. And, you know, again, to have that kind of talent here, um, our, our head of operations, you know, former COO, lots of HR experience, large company, small company experience, uh, our head of business development, um, done billions of dollars of deals. And so if you think about that talent level and the talent that is drawn to a sure uh, capital portfolio back company because of um, in the way we run companies with basically our playbook and the, and the upside, all of our employees are investors in the company, which I think is really important. If you think about that talent that we have at a small, because we're a small company right now, we're you know less than $50 million in revenue. Um, and that will, that will grow quickly, but that type of talent doesn't typically work at a 15, 16 employee, two doctor practice in South Atlanta, right? Like it's just, it's hard to find that. So when we can get that talent focused on your practice, we should be able to help accelerate, you know, your growth and optimization, of your practice faster. So that, that's how we think about those resources, if that matters. Yeah. So, you know, one of the you know, kind of the main pivoting points, I think with just healthcare is like data and technology. And you kind of talked about the IT side and, you know, how important it is. And, you know, also there's the other end of like the data and analytics and driving decision-making and business decisions. So how do you see that as part of your strategy, you know, when you're talking to these offices or even, you know, when you're looking at hiring somebody and, and what that, you know, kind of means to the companies that you work with. Yeah, I think it's important to view that as, you know, history or future, right? Most of the data is history. This is what, this is what's already happened. And then you can, you know, lean in and understand, well, why did it happen and what, what drivers affected it? Uh, but, you know, it can take you a month to close your financials and, well, we don't want to view it yet because something's in the wrong bucket and it can be really slow. So the historical data 
Some of it you can get as it happens, and some of you can get much later. But by the time you understand it, react to it, and execute against something to change it, it's a, it's two or three months. It's, it's too late. And so timeliness of data is is critical. So all of that data needs to be immediate and needs to be actionable. And then what data are you looking at that's future? And one, one of my favorite pieces of data, which is very, very simple at all of our practices, how many appointments are on the books in the next six weeks? Like just what's, what's the absolute number? And we track that over time. And if there's a, a drop, we, we address the drop. It's just simple as looking at your calendar the next two weeks and fill in the holes, right? But this way we get this enterprise level view of all the practices in terms of what, what's the future look like and what do we need to do to address it? But yeah, you can't, you can't run a business without data. It's, uh, it's like, I don't know, putting golf, putting blindfolded, right? Like you don't know where it's going, but if you can hear the crowd, you can at least get an idea, right? So there's all the senses you have to use and data is definitely the most important one. I do want to go back to what you were saying about the strategic resources. Um, I, I found it so interesting. You've got all of these people with such great experiences and you've brought them into this one hub that you're providing access to, which I think is brilliant. Um, and it's something that people don't realize is so valuable because you're not going to get these minds all in the same room all the time. <laughs> so um, I think it's a unique strategy. I think it's great that you're doing that for a lot of these these companies. Well, I can't take the credit for it. It's, this is a short playbook. I mean, we do this at, at all the shore investments. And you know, as I think you've, you've viewed quickly, it just makes sense. Right, definitely. Well, one of uh, my favorite questions that we like to ask, um, the whole premise of this podcast, the no filter moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tell us with no filter on here, um, what are some major staffing shortages, uh, or some issues you're seeing across the board with these major staffing shortages? And what's the best advice you can give for retaining employees, but in the most honest way? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I thought about this question and the first five things that came up, I can't say, um, just because I think it'd be really bad, but it is unbelievable, unfathomable to, to hear the stories of, you know, either people don't even show up for interviews or they get the job and they're never heard from again, or they come for a day and they just, they're gone. Like, I don't know how these folks are paying their bills or maybe they're not, or if they've never had to work a day in their life, but I, I this whole great resignation and entitlement, uh, it's just so hard for me to understand as, uh, you know, a small town farmer unsuccessful, by the way, like our, our farm was awful we went through drought went through high interest rates we lost the farm we literally lost the farm when i was a kid and so it's you're scratching and clawing and you're sewing your shoes together so you can play with your buddies and then you have people that that it's not not worth their time to push the lawnmower like like it's just they don't want to work i just don't get it right i don't get people that don't create for their own and maybe it's because they're getting something for free or they don't need it um but when you find that right person, that right employee, that's the right fit for your your values of your organization, hang on to them. And you'll you'll hang on to them if you know what your values are and if they're good values and if you live those values and if they're aligned. That that's the best thing you can do because that that focus on what your values are will help solidify a strong culture. Like everybody says, oh, that company has a great culture, and then when you ask them how to define it. It's, it, it gets tough, but I think if you define it through what the core values are of your organization, you can articulate it. People can understand if it makes sense. Um, and if your leaders are leading through those values, then, you know, people are going to want to work there. But if your leaders are not, um, you know, demonstrating those values or, or if they're not, you know, walking the talk, then it's, it's not going to work. I've um, I've recently heard from other DSO leaders that they're having trouble with um, some of their employees that will make up a lot of excuses and just won't show up randomly like the day of and say, oh, I don't have gas money, can't get to work. Um, and so they, they might not have their priorities um, where they need to be, but as a business owner, what, what can you say to people that are experiencing that, how to, how to approach that type of situation? 
Yeah, I, I can't really speak to the specifics of I don't have gas money to get to work, right? And it could be systemic. I, I, I don't know what that issue would be. But, it, you know, I, I would say hire slow and fire fast. Like, take your time to find the right people. If you're just going to fill the spot, it's going to vacate as quick, as easily and as quickly as you filled it, right? Get, get to know the person, understand their values. You know, remember that an interview is demonstrating your best behavior, right? If I'm a candidate... I'm going to give you the answers I think you want to hear generally, right? That's what people want. If you want the job, you want to be liked, you want the right answers. Um, and then in some period of time, call it six, 12 months, you're going to act like who you are. So use behavioral based interview questions, use assessment tools. There's a lot of assessment tools that are even free, right? Assess yourself and, and, and recognize, you know, what, uh, what are your tendencies and how you really are and be honest about it and, and put your assessment up on the wall and say, Hey, I'm really weak at this area. And I try to compensate it for, by doing this, but at least now you'll understand why when I'm stressed, this is how I act. It's not that I don't like you. It's how I act. I try, I try not to do it. Right. And if you're open and honest about that, then your team can be the same way with each other. Like we literally have our behavioral assessments for everybody up on the wall. They're up on the wall for everybody. So when you go to meet somebody, you don't understand why something just happened. You go read their assessment and you're like, oh, they hate details. Like for me, it's just like, hey, give me the drive through version. Like we're, I understand all, like where are you trying to get to? And then walk me through it versus like the big setup. Like just get me to the answer. And, but everybody understands that. And, and when we're talking, I can, you know, I can make like fun of myself, be a little self-deprecating in terms of, you know, what, what view I like to have in discussions but it's, it's just good to be transparent. Yeah, I actually really like that idea um, to be able to evaluate their strengths and weaknesses, things that they don't really jive well with um, and having them out there for people to understand. We do in clusters as well. Like we graph everybody in terms of the clusters. So like we, we have, you know, certain clusters when they're together, they're all in la la land dreaming, but no one's gonna execute the plan. So like we have to, we have to really decide to execute this or we have to get somebody in here to describe this and make sure there's actionable next steps or we'll never get anywhere. But now they know that. Right. Yeah. It's great. What about um, doing like pulse checks or um, like an incentivization program? What do you think about those? Yeah. Pulse checks, like office vibes, stuff like that. Just checking in with your staff and um, seeing, you know, how they're doing and if they, you know, if they have any recommendations on things that could change or be better. Yeah, for sure. I think, I mean, humanizing the job is really important, right? Because, well, I don't, I don't know what the stats are or whatever. 65% of people say their best friend is a coworker, right? So it's, it's pretty important that you have an environment where, you know, you can, you can humanize it as well. Oh yeah. So like, yeah, completely. Yeah, I'd agree. Very <laughs> valuable. Yeah. Uh, I have an obvious question. Just one. I, you know, I think it's not really, you know, and this is just from my point of view, but it's not about the interview process more so for me, it's understanding how you get them to the interview, which you talked about a little bit, right? Is the, is the number one issue is like getting them actually there. And so I know a lot of that comes down to, you know, how you position your job postings online and kind of how you're, you know, assessing the role and all of that. So is there any tips that you have for somebody that's trying to create a job posting and, you know, needs better engagement from Mar that? Market your job. Don't list the job description. Don't list, like, like, like there's so many horrible ads out there that, you know, I don't know, you get bored, you don't even get past the first paragraph, right? But if you're, if your company loves dogs, then then talk about the dogs in your office, right? Like you want to talk about something fun for people to connect to and capture them, right? If, if you look at good marketing to get consumers to change behavior, it captures them, right? It doesn't give me all the features and benefits of the macaroni, right? It lets me be in that spirit. So I, I think have a little fun with it, but let, let them see who you are. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. That's one of the first things that I always look at, even on a website, if I'm checking out a company in general. Wait, are you on a job do, search right now? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> no, not at all. But in my past, yes, definitely. But, you know, what I do is I look at company about us pages and I'm, yeah. I, I want to see who the people are behind the company. And 
Uh, if it's fun, I'm like, oh, these people are awesome. I want to, <laughs> I definitely want to talk to them. I get excited to talk to them. So I think even just having yourself marketed appropriately on your company website helps too, because the the people that are looking for a job are going to do their own research. At least you hope. <laughs> yeah. I <don't> think. <laughs> um, but I also heard something interesting as well. Um, so what do you think about um, when you start the hiring process or you put the job out there having like a bank of resumes? You know, you found, you know, let's say 15 people applied and you had great interviews with five people, but you found that one person that's the perfect match. Do you keep those other four um, in mind so that you have them to reference back to if you ever need to fill another role? Or... Yeah, I would hope organizationally you're you're always recruiting. Even yeah. if you don't have a spot, like you, you, as, as a as a surgeon or you know multi site healthcare leader at the local practice, you know who in your community stands out, right? And you'd always be dropping the hey, if you ever want to come see what we do, love to sh- love to show you what we're up to. It seems like you really fit in well with our team, even if you're fully staffed. You know, I think it's just really important to, to always be recruiting, just like you are for patients, right? Like you. You have a full schedule. You don't stop marketing. Right. No, it's a good point, but I think people need to hear it because I think people get very literal about the hiring process and think, okay, I've got this one position to fill. I'm going to fill it and I'm good. Yeah, 100%. And then, and then they struggle when it comes back to, okay, now I need to fill this position again and I got to start all over. It's like, no, you, you have some people you've already talked to. <laughs> it's the sales and marketing funnel, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh. No. Thank you for being on today's episode. Um, To learn more about OMS 360, visit OMS360.com. And don't forget to subscribe or um, comment below if you have any questions for us. Thanks, Trevor. Thank you, too.